Y'all know how it goes when it be gritty. When we roll, it's like we got the key to the city. It won't be pretty for you to challenge. Knock you off balance, bit tuck. Reconsider your talent. In the mid 90s, at a time in music when the West Coast hip hop was dominating the playing field, a group from Brooklyn changed the focus back to the East Coast. You weasel, you're better off pumping diesel. I find it feasible, your days is over front and evil. Shout out to your people trying to bless your spot. But we don't believe that, cause CBS tells a lot on who got shot and who does all the crime. Danger. And y'all knew it all the time. When I first heard that Danger joint, man, I'm not even gonna front. I thought, I thought Premier made it. When I very, when I heard it for the first, first, first time. You gotta, that record came out in 1995, and you have to remember, here in New York City, um, things started to change a little bit. And what I mean by that is, is that in the early 90s, like 92, 93, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and the West Coast, they was killing. One thing was, coming out of it when the East is in the house record, no one wanted to touch us because what happened with Tupac and Big. It was in that time period where we started the hip hop artists started to take claim. The New York hip hop artists started to kind of retake that claim that this hip hop game was ours. And this is the untold story of Blase Blase. Oh Back in East New York, Brooklyn, was a young out loud. Today, he's known as Blase Blase. At the young age of 10 years old, he started to pen some of his entry-level rhymes to start his quest on building his confidence as an MC. I started rapping when I was like nine, 10 years old, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, I had older brothers and sisters. He used to write in a book and he would just write rhymes. He was left-handed. So when he leaves books around the house, we couldn't understand because he wrote like a doctor. We didn't know what he was saying. He didn't walk around the house um, vocalizing his rap, but he ended up being good with it. And then when his name came out, he came out with the name MC Out Loud. I had an older sister that was a rapper. And um, so at a young age, man, I was hit with the bug. Um, you know how my pops was into the choir. He was in church, he's from like South Carolina. So he was like singing with his church when he was younger. So he always be singing in the crib. As Blase got older, he started to perfect his skills. He met a producer by the name of Paul C., who is legendary for producing tracks, engineering, and mixing, who had his hands in most of the hardcore hip-hop artists that came out of New York in the late 80s, early 90s. Yo, when I first went to the studio, I went to the studio out in Queens called 1212 with, um, you know what I'm saying, DJ, uh, with uh, Paul C. Yeah, Paul C. And... um. Paul C. took me under his wing. This was like late 80s. You know what I'm saying? This was like late 80s. Um, Paul C. took me under his wing when, uh, you know, he had them big records on the, that was out. Super Lover C, Casting Over Rudd and all that. You know, Duty James and all that was popping off when he was doing work with Rakim, messing with um, Large Professor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was just like the young dude. He was like, yo, I like your voice, man. You could do something, man. You know, Paul C. had a vision. He was a visionary. A lot of people think he was just, you know, into engineering, but he had a, he had a vision. Yo, he taught me about mixing. You know what I'm saying? He taught me about mixing, laying a hook down, making sure you have a hot hook, the importance of a, you know, chorus. Uh, you know, just imagine him working with like, um, you know, Super Lover C, the records they had, and stuff like that. So, you know, um, and Rakim, you know, the chorus was important, making sure the beat is mixed right, making sure the beat is tight. You know what I'm saying? Having that ear to mixing a record. That's what um, Paul C. brought to the table. After Blase spent time with Paul C. creating music, a mutual friend introduced him to Big Daddy Kane's DJ, Mr. C. That introduction would be imperative to Blase's career later on. You know, I, I um, first got to know Blase Blase. I think I met them the second Big Daddy Kane album that I was a part of, It's a Big Daddy Thing, 1989. I think that's when I got to know Out Loud and P.F. Cutting, and then eventually I started managing them. Yeah, man, it's like, it's, 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 it's dope, man, because I knew these brothers for a long time. I knew them I knew them ever since, like, me and Kane's second album since, like, 89, and, and you know, I was trying to, like, 
get them get them on like sort of like the same time I was getting Biggie Smalls on and then they went on and got their own deal with, with a brother by the name of Domingo and they just did their own thing and got everything going, you know what I'm saying? And then they came back to me, you know what I'm saying? It was like, yo, we want you to manage us. And I was like, yo, I never managed a group in my life. And they was like, well, yo, you got experience. So I said, well, I'll try it. And here I am, you know. And now we got the little management team. We got my man Eon right here. You know what I'm saying? We got my man Eli right there. Trying, we just trying to build. All these people that's right over here, everybody that's here, is from the foundation. They've been here since day one when, when Brothers was on little independent labels, when they was coming out through Bobby Condor's label. All these brothers has been here, you know what I'm saying? And and got my man Dark Man right here. He's gonna he's gonna be coming out real soon. And my man PF Cutting is working with another group called the Verbal Hoods. So just trying to uproot, uproot, keep bringing out some more people from their from their clique from the east. You know what I'm saying? East New York. Just do it like that. You mean big? Had a relationship before we put out music. Right. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, you know, um, we was managed by DJ Mr. C. Oh, both of you guys. Both of us. So, you know, Big was, he got put on first. You know what I'm saying? When he did his thing through Source Magazine and all that. But, you know, I was there with them when um, he was trying to break his record. You know, doing the touring. I used to get my mother's van and take him, Mr. C, DJ 50 Grand on tour. I had an ear for music. I had an ear for voice. It was something different. So I hunted Mr. C down. It took a week before I ran into him. I called up with him 2.30 in the morning. Yo, listen to the demo. I ain't got time, I gotta go back on the road. See, you gonna listen to this demo. So he finally listened to it. He said, I see you ready. He drove around the block, stopped. He said, yo, I'll be back such and such a day. When I come back, I wanna meet this guy. But it usually be me, Blase Blah, Mr. C, B.I.D. Way before Junior Mafia. Way before Junior Mafia was even thought about. It was me, blah, 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 Mr. C, B.I.G. Yeah, we I used to do was ad-libs on tour. Uh. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, we used to go to the Carolinas when he was just like breaking the party and bullshit record and all that. Now this is prior to him actually bad Make, boy. A major record. No, he right. was on party bullshit was on bad boys, but um he didn't have a big project. Right. He was still trying to get Puff's attention and get budgets. So he had to go out and work the record. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, we um so that's when he got his people. So he got, you know, he got me. We went on the road. He got his boy Big D. And um we hit the road, man. We went down south and we just performed the record. I thought that was a great move for Mr. C. I thought it was great for both of them. In the beginning, people gave the Blas a hard way to go. Um A um Mercury Records wanted him to have a more main line management. They wanted him to um, go with someone like named Chris Lighty, and but De Blas said no, he refused. He stuck with his friend Calvin, Mr. C, and it worked out great. At the end of everything, Mr. C did a great job that Mercury Records wanted him to work in the a r department. That's strange, because at, at that time, and I was going to say, you know, that's when Big's out, because that's like 95 ever you talking Nah, that's about. like really 93. 93. 92, 93, actually. Party and Bullshit. Party and Bullshit. The album, when his album came out. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. Was it the 94? Something that's when him and Craig yeah. came out with right. the albums, Ready to Die yeah. and uh, Mac, uh, Project uh, Funk, The War. Yeah. So, y'all was tight at that time. Oh, yeah, we was tight. So that's what's kind of like, it kind of made another scenario because it's like, oh, okay, Big got this record with Pac. Right. I mean, Big going against Pac, they going at right. it. Right. And now one of Big's people got this East Coast record. Right. So it kind of really all made that story, you know what I mean? Did, did y'all ever create music together that we never heard? Or was there talk about y'all doing we, stuff? Yeah, we, 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 we was in big talk about it. Right. Um. We created music inside the van on the road to South Carolina and on the road down south, you know what I mean? We was right. always creating music. We didn't really get into the studio and record no new music. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but like we was always listening to beats and um, just creating ideas on the road. So what made you go this way and Big, big go that way? Because at some point it was just about him and the Junior Mafia. Right. So. Um, was it more like you was just kind of you? Because at that point you was your own artist too. Yeah, right. I mean, just he was on Bad Boys. Right. He was on Bad Boys, and I was still trying to get my deal. Right. You know what I'm saying? I was still, you know, working my working my project or trying to get my project going. Mm -hmm. And um, that's that's what that was. He was going into you know putting out major records. 
and uh, I was going to making a demo, going back to the studio, making my right. demo. Trying to get another yeah. situation. Trying to get another, trying right. to get a situation. So what happened with you and Mr. C? Well, Mr. me and Mr. C, we, um, he was, when we, we got our deal, he was the manager of Mercury. He, um, he went to working for the label, Mercury label. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? As one of the A&Rs. Mm, I never knew that. Yeah, as one of the A&Rs of Mercury Records. And um, we left Mercury Records, so that was kind of it. You know what I'm saying? He went his way, I went mine. Um, and they were so easy to work with, man. Um, always on time. You know, any advice that I give them, they would, you know, take heed to my advice. Um, it really wasn't much work working with those guys because they was hard workers. They wanted to get on. They wanted to be successful in the rap game. And so managing them didn't really take much, man. You know, um, I think they brought me on board because of my expertise and my experience being um, DJing and touring with Big Daddy Kane and making records with Kane. And I think that's why they had me on board as you know, the manager, but to managing him was, was, was very easy. During his time with Mr. C, Blase met a neighborhood DJ and producer by the name of P.F. Cutting. Their initial relationship began as a young MC out loud wanting to rap at the BK parties in East New York, where P.F. was the man behind the music. Eventually, they would agree to work with each other and start producing songs. One of the first songs they produced and recorded was Danger. That was produced by me and DJ P of Cutting. I produced that underground hard drums, hard loops, no keyboards, all samples. You know, that's, that's how I be fucking with it. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, you like I said earlier, you got to roll with the times. If not, you get lost. When I first heard uh, that Danger joint, my head blew off because, you know, first of all, I, I thought, Premier made the beat. I was just like, well, what Premier done did now? And then when I found out he didn't and PF Cutting made the beat, I was out. That that really, really tossed. And I was like, damn. Not, you know, like, shit was amazing. It was an amazing record. Amazing beat. Shout out to PF Cutting on, on the beat. You know what I'm saying? That shit was hot sauce, bro. I think that really, uh, grounded him and that was the foundation and you know on yo I can do this. I don't I don't need to have like a, a major record producer. Me and my man from around the corner can really put this together and then travel the world and let them see our vision and make them feel, you know, like they said the pain I feel, you know what I mean? So I think that was a, a, a big part of that. Also during that period which was crazy too, like I used to me and Blah would go over the Gates Avenue, which was which I thought was nuts, because I, th I think that was like C's crib or whatever it was, and um, we was in Gates Avenue in Bed-Stuy before this gentrification and stuff, so it was a, a lot of activity going on, this, that, that, this, and um, you know, celebrities would be pulling up the CC or whatever it was, and, and you know what I mean, and he want to hear his music and drop his mixtapes off and or whatever they was doing, but I thought that was really dope, you know, and I, I think that also reflects why the, the music sounded the way it did during that era, because things were just so organic and it was just, you know, um, reflective of, of the community. Laze was connected to a few known artists prior to signing his deal with Mercury Records, like Notorious B.I.G., Master Ace, Group Home, J. Rue the Damager, and Premier and Gangstar. For about 10 years, Blase Blase and P.F. Cutton played the background producing records for local Brooklyn Cats. Their biggest placement before their success was on one of Master Ace's albums. It's crazy that we, we're talking about Blase and, and and the music and um him and PF Cutting's accomplishments, but you know prior prior to them having a hit record and all of that, they they really was like knocking out hot hip hop demos and music that was reflective of the community and what you know the urban struggle was. You definitely had a distinctive voice, right? You know, um, I always thought. That was maybe something produced by me. Right. That's, in my head, that's what I thought. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, there was another artist 
J was damaging. Right. That kind of had a similar sound. Yeah, yeah. Everybody always, you know what I'm saying? I mean, East New York is distinctive. Right. Like, people today be like, yo, you sound like Uncle Murder. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, right, right, voice, right. I hear it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, that's my man. And it's like, we from the East. That's what the East do. Right. You know what I'm saying? You have that energy. You got that vibration. That's what it is, man. That's what growing up in the streets of East New York. We products of that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, people thought that of J. Rule. Actually, J. Rule was, um, J. Rule, my people. You know what I'm saying? Right. Was y'all down? Right, there? right, right. J. So Rule's my people. Same camp. Same, camp, right. same neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? We hung out together. You know what I mean? Um, actually, I feel responsible in getting J. Rule and encouraging him to rap and do hip hop. Because I was doing hip hop so young when J. Rule wasn't even rapping or thought about rapping on a professional level. So, um, you know, by me going into the studio, he used to come with me into the studio with the Paul C's and all that. And um, I think that helped him get on his road to do what he did. You know what I mean? Blase Blase, J. Rule the Damager, Gangstar and Premier were all part of the same clique out of Brooklyn. According to Blase, Premier laced everyone with tracks for their demos and records. But when Premier laced J. Rue the Damager with the beat to 10 Crack Commandments as a promo record for radio, things got a little sticky with the crew when it wound up on Biggie's album. So tell me, you were, you you had a relationship with Big. Right. We had a relationship with J. Rue. Yeah. And they, you know, there were some records made. Yeah. Kind of what what was your thoughts on that and how did what position I mean, did that put you I, in? I, I feel like that was really about DJ Premier. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Premier, in what way? Oh, just mean just Premier getting the music the out there? No, nah, Premier was doing the beat. You know what I'm right. saying? Premier did the beat. Right. So I think the, the discrepancy may have been Ten Crack Commandments. Mm -hmm. That beat. That I first heard the record, Jay Rue was on the record. Mm. But it wasn't an official record. I think that was just something he had in the studio or he did it for a radio station or something like that. Promo record. Big and Puff came was like, yo, they wanted that record. So Premier made the choice. I'm going to give the record to, um, to Puff. And these are facts. It's common sense. You know what I'm saying? It's common sense. I'm not going to say exactly on how, what the decision was right. going on in Premier's head, but... Um, you putting it together, right, being right. an insider. Yeah, they, right. That was a promo record that J. Rue did with the Ten Crack Commandments beat. You know what I'm saying? Premier did something that was, he was like, yo, let me, this is a bigger situation. So I guess, you know, maybe J. Rue felt the way, I don't know, he might have felt the way about it, but that pushed hip hop forward, though, man. Right. Doing that for Big and Puff, right. that was really something that hip hop needed, you know what right. I mean? So what happened is I got one of my people's named Domingo, which is also a, pr a producer in the industry. You know, I had played on my music and um, he thought it was incredible. And he took it to record companies. And um, we had actually started a bidding war right. with um, a few different, few different record companies. So what was on these demos? What songs was on? Anything that we knew that came out? Or? Yeah. Um, when the East in the House was on it. In the early 90s, like 92, 93, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and the West Coast, they was killing. They was killing us. And then with the surgence of people like Nas and Biggie, um, you know, and then even Jay-Z later on, you know, the East, we started kind of taking back those reins. So a record like Danger when the East is in the House was so important not just for New York City, but for the East Coast as well, because, um, you know, it kind of, it was in that time period where we started, the hip hop artists started to take claim, the New York hip hop artists started to kind of retake that claim that this hip hop game was ours. And it wasn't a diss record. It wasn't like they was trying to diss the West Coast or nothing like that. It was just you know, Blase Blase being proud of where they was from. But the thing about the Blase record that's so crazy is that it's about East New York. And East New York is its own continent. Okay, we're not a country, we're a continent. So when the East is in the house, oh my God, that means a lot of things. Shout out Blase Blase. Yo, the East is in the house was just about, yo, we were just trying to bang on other neighborhoods, man. It wasn't even about East Coast West. We was trying to bang on 
neighborhoods in New York. But you know what we thought? We right. thought it was like you meant East right. Coast. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. We was trying to bang on Harlem. We was trying to bang on, you know, um, Bed Stop. You know what I'm saying? We was trying to bang on Queens. It's just let people know the East is in the house. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's what that was about, man. And he really did good. And when that song Danger hit, the whole block, everybody loved it because then the limousine started pulling up. All his friends started coming around and he would go on the car. He would tell us, um, I'll be back. I'm going to do a show. But he didn't know me and my friends, we would be behind him and our car following him. And we would go to the show and watch them and just do different things. And we all have fun, not just him and his group and his posse, it was all of us, the whole block, the whole neighborhood. We enjoyed his time out there and and and, and the fun that he had, it became all of our fun. Yo, I mean, I mean, I'm grounded. I, I, I got, I live in a household with six women, you know what I'm saying, which is my oldest sisters. Right. I stay ground, I still had to come home and empty the garbage at the time, you know what I mean? So it was just like, that kept you grounded, you know what I'm saying? And I think being around women like that really put me in the right perspective, you know what I mean? But, yo, I, I was like, I was always a live dude. I was always making it happen in Brooklyn. So it wasn't really like, I came, as far as the music industry came out and became relevant, but in my neighborhood, in my community, I was always relevant. So it was originally them talking about them being from, Brooklyn and East New York, when the East is in the house, we're from East New York, Brooklyn, but then it took a life of its own as it being a big record, you know, anybody from the East Coast can resonate with when the East is in the house. Oh my God, danger. We had that record that we was working on, but we was like, yo, let's make it better. And we kept on working on it. And then that's when we kind of changed the music around and came up with what you hear today. It wasn't really like shocking, shocking to me per se. Um, I actually thought, and in, in being with them, running around the streets with Blah, most cats was like, "Yeah, I see, I see you doing your thing, fam." We got the record to the record company. The record companies was going crazy. Which record um, it was, we we went to Mercury. Um, but then we had like Loud Records that wanted the project. We had um, Def Jam that wanted the project. And um, we was at the record company. We kind of like pulled back a little bit at first um, just to see what we could bring to the table as far as money-wise and deal-wise, just make a more sexier deal. Mercury was more serious. They brought more money to the table and they was more serious. Loud said they can play another role, which was they handled the um, promotion. So it was kind of almost like a joint venture where Mercury was our company and Loud came in to do the um, promotion of the record. Because Loud had a lot of artists on their record company at the same time, you know, and it was, we thought we was going to get lost. Right. Same thing with Def Jam, felt we was going to get lost. So at the time, Mercury was sexy because we, it wasn't too many artists, hip hop artists on Mercury Records. Well, it was a definitely it was definitely a perfect fit at that time. I, I look at Blase Blase out loud and PF Cutton. I look at what they did as a continuation of what Gangstar started. You know, like what Premier and Guru started with the two man band situation, where Pete Rock and CL Smooth started with the two man band situation. 
in the 90s. Being a top 40, having a, a, a boom bap record, a hip hop record, hit the top 40. You know what I'm saying? Billboard top 40 was, it was crazy. It was amazing. It was, it was a fantasy. Right. You know what I mean? And um, I had no idea that that, was, that would be like that when we was creating a record. But I knew the record was hot. You know what I'm saying? I knew the record um, was, it was, it, it was, um, I knew the record was, I knew the record was crazy. I knew the record was hot, man. I just didn't know that it could be a Billboard Top 40. I could never vision that. Blase Blase and P.F. Cutton would go on to release their debut album, Blah Blah Blah, which introduced the duo to the world through the record Danger. The record peaked at number two on the rap, number 24 on R&B, and number 46 on the Billboard Hot 100, which signaled things for the group was going in the right direction. Soon after, the label would have its own idea on the direction they would want the group to go in, which would cause an internal conflict. According to Blase, the record Danger with the chorus when the East is in the house fueled the already existing rap beef between the East and West Coast rappers. I mean, they needed a blame. They needed somebody to blame. So, um, you know, we was kind of, we, we was the damage. We was the collateral damage. You know, um, you know, it was murder. It was murder in the street. There was blood in the streets and everybody was acting like they had nothing to do with it. You know what right. I'm saying? Um, from the record companies to the magazines, it was just like, we're not touching it. And you got that on you. You got that dust on you. You got that debris on you. So, you know, we ain't touching you. And it's from that record they feel. Oh, yeah. It's from that record. It's from that movement. It's from the marketing dollars that was put into that movement. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's all that. It was all that. So you said you walked away from Mercury. Yeah. Why? I walked away from Mercury because of um, what they created in Mercury, what they wanted us to do, how they wanted us to change the music. Right. So, you know, that's the whole thing. It was like walking away. So at the time, I'm like, yo, you know, we got the, one of the hottest albums, one of the hottest projects. It would be easy to find a deal like it's nothing. Right. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, that wasn't the case. You know, record, the record industry was changing gears and it was moving into another direction. So now you have this popularity, you have right. these hit records, and now you're trying to move from a place that kind of created that. Right. So where does that put you guys now? So what are you thinking musically now? Now we got all these good things going, but they put this kind of stigma against us. So what are y'all trying to do at this point? Um, we're trying to put music out, you know what I mean? Right. We're trying to put music out, but you know, the consensus was, you are part of the East Coast, West Coast. Beef. Beef. We don't want nothing to do with that. You know what I'm saying? We going in this direction. Um, and it, it was part of two, it wasn't just the East Coast, West Coast beef, it was New York in general. They didn't want to touch New York based on the way New, what New York was doing with the record companies. The artist, record company relationship. Right. Um, artists was going up to the record companies with like 50 dudes, you know what I'm saying? Jumping on the train with 50 dudes, going up to the record companies, holding people in record company hostage. So record companies was like, we're not dealing with New York. Right. We're not dealing, if you could take a train here, we're not messing with you. Right. You know what I mean? It was really that simple. It was like, that was the thought. So all the New York artists at that time was, was left out in the cold. The relationship between artists and label can be more like oil and water, especially when it comes to creative and financial sticking points. Sometimes the artists take matters into their own hands, and that's when the streets usually meet the boardroom. According to Blase, there was an incident where Master Ace and Blase and their Brooklyn crew had to pay a label exec a visit. Yo, I mean, Ace was in a situation where he wasn't, the label was dissing him, you know what I mean? They wasn't getting him. They was, I guess they was taking something back, or they was just, um, they, had a, they had a contract discrepancy. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna get into the details of what exactly it was, but Ace Wing, Ace Wing got his crew from Brooklyn, and we went up to the label. You know, what was that like? What happened? That was crazy. We went up to the label. We held everybody hostage in the label. Like you, you wouldn't know? let nobody leave? Nobody could leave. Nobody can come in. And we put Ace with his record exec, this one room, talk it out. Right. So Ace was able to um, straighten out the situation. Now, 
I have some info, inside information on that album. Right. You can verify this yeah, yeah. if you want. So I heard that Ace put a bullet right. on, on the desk right. of Lenny Fischelberg, I think it's yeah. the one. Well, that wasn't actually Ace. That was one of my other people. Oh. But okay. a bullet was definitely left on his desk with his, with his initials on it. Right. You know what I'm saying? But it didn't actually come from the hand of Ace. Got you. You know what I mean? Right. But and, yeah, yeah. And internally, I, I heard that just started a whole different thing. But I, I believe, watching the interview, I believe Ace got what he wanted. Yeah, that Ace, moment. that was the whole thing. See, a lot of people say that, um, oh, yo, that's the mafia. Why would you do that to a mafia? But I'm saying we Brooklyn. And the whole thing is, now, Lenny, it could have went both ways. Right, right. That's what we understand when we went in there. You know what I'm saying? We could have got pulled over by the police on the way up there. Right. You know what I'm saying? We knew the risk we was taking, but that's, it was worth it to us. Because you're familiar with Lenny Fischelberg and of who course. he was and who he was associated with. Yeah, of right, course, right. of course. But that, I'm saying it's like, we didn't care. That's the whole thing. You're going up against somebody that don't care. You know what I'm saying? Anytime, you know what I'm saying, you don't care, you don't, you, you, you really, the situation got resolved. Right. And that's based on we didn't give a fuck. Right. So, you know, that's what it was. And that's what created a situation where Ace can continue to make a successful, um, historic career. Right. Sometimes it takes that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that, at that juncture, that's what it was. And where was you at in your career? Was your songs out then, or was this nah, before? I was this not. Was, okay, so you was just. Yeah, I was not. I was just. I was moving just that, and shaking. Yeah, I was just moving and shaking out in Brooklyn. According to Blas, prior to the world knowing him for the record Danger, his relationships with Stethosonic, J. Rue the Damager, Master Ace, and Biggie were solid as a rock. And at that time, Blase was more focused on production. Or he was part of the crew that held each other down. Shout out my man, Craze the King of Content. Yo, let me tell you this about Blase. A couple of things. One, in Brooklyn, in the beginning, Stetsasonic was the name in Brooklyn. Before Kane, before Biggie, before Jay-Z, Stetsasonic was the name. A lot of people don't know that hardheads like Blase and them held us down. They was young boys, but before they started rapping, let's just say they was um, oon with the G on the front. Anyway, um, we go back a little bit because P.F. Cutting, who, who worked with Blase and produced the record, we did a record way back with my, one of my best friends, his name is Ernie Ball. He is um, first blind MC. We did this MC Watch Out record on Tommy Boy. You know, when the East is in the house, just definitely kind of gave us a sense of pride of where we came from and that the East Coast rappers were starting to have a resurgence in this hip hop game. So that's how, you know, the sound of danger, you know, kind of changed hip hop in New York. We took pride in that record. We took pride in where we came from because of that record. And I had the pleasure also of a and r and you know, Blase, Blase, debut album, blah, 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 um, when it was on Mercury Records. And that process was a, a easy process as well because I didn't have to tell them much. They knew how to make records. Out Loud and PF Cut knew how to make records. They knew the formula. Uh, I was just a fly on the wall during their recording sessions, just kind of in awe of... Um, how well experienced that they was, even though they wasn't well experienced. But I think being around people like myself and um, even, you know, around Premier and Guru and J. Ru the Damager, like, you know, you know, Out Loud and P.F. Cutting was around those guys. So being around all of us, you know, when it was their time to record the Blah 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 album and I had to A&R it, it, it <laughs> I didn't really A&R it. It was like me just sitting there um and me uh, kind of just um, looking at them in awe of, of how well they knew how to make records. So I, I was just honored to be a part of that debut album and, you know, be considered as an A&R of the album, even though I don't feel like I did much. But salute the Blase Blase. According to Blase, a female lawyer was not accepted into the boys club on the upper crest of the hip hop game. In order for his career to reach new heights, the powers that be put pressure on his legal team to change genders. I didn't know that I didn't know that the gay mafia was so big. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know that 
you know, um, I didn't know that aspect. Like all my life, I wanted to be a part of the music industry. And when I got into the music industry and had that success, I walked away from all that money. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, I was never cut off a record label. I walked away. Right. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people don't know that. You know what I mean? Um, and what made you walk away? Because of the position they put us in. And the thing, um, the things they was asking us to do. Remember, that's like the late, going into the late 90s now. Right. So they was transitioning music to hear what you're hearing now. So you, what was they asking you to do? And what position did they put you up in? Well, um, one thing was coming out of when the East is in the house record, no one wanted to touch us because what happened with Tupac and Big. So they kind of took us as responsible. You know, they built us, they built us up as that. They built us up as a big East Coast record, East Coast, East versus West. Right. And then, right, and then when everything spilt over, we don't want nothing to do with it. We don't want to touch y'all. That's what y'all did. You know, that that was y'all creation. And now we, you know, the music industry is going in another direction. So, um, a lot of time, and with my record company, they wanted us to transform into the new sound. Nah, we wasn't willing to do, do new sound, new look, new everything. It was like, nah. Right, now you said the, the, the gay mafia. Right. What is that? Um, there's so many times, like, in it, I've been told, this is high as you're going to go unless you fire your lawyer. I had a female lawyer. And it was like, you can't go no further. So you get rid of your lawyer, get you a male lawyer. And it was so many things like that, that I was, um... Oh, so you don't mean like gay people, you just saying shit that was... No, they said that I was, the, the, my female lawyer could not be accepted in the boys club. You know what I'm saying? So if I don't make those changes, I mean, it was things like that. I can't get into everything, but it was things like that that was like, you know, I was like, for me being in the music business all my, wanted to be in the music business all my life, I was kind of like, I'm good. Right. You so know? how do you think that changed you, just as an artist, moving forward from that point, once you start seeing all these other things that you didn't I mean, I kind of, I know when I seen the music business change to what it is, the sound of it, you know what I'm saying, what it's representing, I seen it, I was there, I seen it coming, I seen it happening. I was there when it was, um, when it was just a thought, when it was just an idea. You know, when they was in the boardrooms and they were saying that this is the direction they want to go into, you know, I was there. So it's amazing to see that they developed it to what it is right now. And so one other thing I want to touch on is, so you saying, because I never heard that, but I think about it now, but I never put it together, let me put it that way. Right. They made your group feel responsible for the East Coast and West Coast Mercury Records. You said. Yeah, I was blackballed. Record companies wouldn't touch it. You know, coming out of a successful project, couldn't get a deal nowhere. Put up the word, Razi has emerged. Surge most preferred from the verbs and words I finesse. Try your best to diagnose when I host. You get to gross, toast, break to grip, bro. When I rumble, you crumble. My stuff is good like Morongo. Rappers get their suit front and rugged While I'll unplug it With my somatic to drug it And expose You know how it goes When it be gritty When we roll It's like we got the key to the city It won't be pretty For you to challenge Knock you off balance Pizza Reconsider your talent You weasel You're better off pumping diesel I find it feasible Your days is over front and evil Shout until your people Trying to bless your spot But we don't believe that Cause CBS tells a lot On who got shot And who does all the crime And you all the time. 